Well, good evening. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. And tonight we're going to get pretty darn real. Um, had a call from a gentleman. And I'm not even going to tell you the story because I'm going to let you kind of figure it out as we go. Um, but it has to do with he and his wife and it has to do with COVID and vaccinations and um, paying the ultimate price for your decisions. And, and I think you're going to be a little bit surprised when you hear this uh, because I was. And uh, so we're going to have that story coming up for you. Uh, Dave Loveall. A uh, friend of mine who is running for county commission seat in Springfield is going to join us tonight. So you guys can find you always gripe at me in the past because you don't know anything about the candidate. So I'm putting on I have a couple I have quite a few coming up. Um, we're going to have different candidates on for everything from governor to uh, county commissioners. I've got the West and East Lane County Commissioner positions coming up later in the month and uh, next month in May. Uh, so we're going to have that coming up for you. Bill London's got some news that's going to irritate you. <laughs> Governor Brown, did you guys see the headline? She released some a, a, a convicted killer who killed a foster kid and left him dead on the side of the road, and she released him. And I don't mean to laugh because it's not funny, but it's so freaking ridiculous. And the first question out of my friend's mouth was, who voted for her anyway? And I go, don't look at me. <laughs> it wasn't me. I'm not like, I had nothing to do with that. Um, so Bill will be here to kind of share some of that with you. And uh, we want to thank our sponsors tonight. When when Matt McCarl at New Leaf Hyperbarics and Wellness heard about Matt's story and Amy's story, um, he wrote me immediately and said, I want to sponsor that show. So Matt McCarl is one of our uh, one of our sponsors for this. Um, also, Chris Daniel Family Dentistry, where everybody matters and where everyone is welcome, no matter what your vaccination status is or uh, the color of your hair or anything. They don't care. Um, but they do like people who love freedom. So, so if, if you don't like freedom, it might not be the place for you. I'm just telling you. And he said I could say that. Um, so that's coming up. And Mercury Metal Design and Fabrication, another wonderful sponsor of our show. So hello, everybody from Monroe, from Lebanon. I uh, love that. And here's, uh, I think at this point, the Brown is mentally ill. <laughs> well, I think it started back when she ran against me for Secretary of State. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that happened. Um, so let's get the open going and I'm gonna bring on our first guest and we'll get right down to it. So here we go. Who puts up with this? That's what I don't understand. Bring the lion out, bring the, bring the lion. Um, tonight on our show, we're gonna have... Hey guys, don't you think it's kind of fun? that you get to comment on the news. There's a cost. Oh yeah, there's a cost. People come after you. Like, I think that's why this is so much fun is because... We'll see you at five. All right, so let me start this way. Um, this is Amy Florian. Florian, is that right, Matt? Is that how I'm saying it right? Florian, isn't she pretty? And this is Matt and Amy. I have to show you one of my favorite pictures right here. Okay, hold on. Okay, here's the straight picture like this. Okay, this is that. What a nice couple. Aren't they beautiful? And then, yeah, that's more like it. <laughs> that's what you really got. So this is Matt and Amy. And Matt called me last week and uh, said, you know, Rick, I got this interesting story that I want to tell. And I told Amy I would tell her story. And so Matt's going to join us. And this is not a story with a super happy ending at all. Um, so tell people, uh, start at the beginning. So Amy had an autoimmune disease. So, you, you start where you want to start it. Yeah. So like uh, in, her, in her early 20s, um, she got diagnosed with, uh, with uh, systemic lupus, um, which is, uh, as far as they know, an autoimmune disease. and. Uh, it uh she didn't really have much uh knowledge about it and neither did the doctors and so uh she uh just kind of dealt with it for you know quite a few years and and uh she would basically it would cause her joints to flare up you know like uh, almost like rheumatoid arthritis like randomly um but we didn't know that it can progress and start affecting organs 
And so in her case, it progressed and started affecting the kidneys and, uh, and started shutting her kidneys down slowly over time. And so, oh, go ahead. So, so more recently, um, well, let's go back to she, 10 years ago, you said, or so, um, she had a vaccine for the flu. So, okay. So in, uh, 2010, 2011, um, right after we got married, uh, uh, she got pregnant and um, we uh, she went over for one of her uh, checkups and we were living at the coast at the time and she came to Eugene for her checkup and uh, the, the doctor had uh, re- suggested that she get a flu vaccine and uh, we always scoffed at the flu vaccines because it's like why not just get the flu you know it's like just you know deal with it normally like we always have um, and uh, you know it just never made sense and so her with the compromised immune system, um, we did, they didn't really take that into effect. Well, and we don't really know if it was for sure or not. Um, it was just a really weird coincidence, but so she got the flu vaccine. Um, she'd never had one in her life, uh, with, uh, takes off, heads back down to the coast within 48 hours after that vaccine, she is in the ICU back in Eugene. Um, the nurse RN on, uh, on duty that night said that she didn't know if she was going to make it through the night. Um, so she, uh, it, pancreatitis was the diagnosis. Um, also she ended up as a type one diabetic and also miscarried the baby. And this was all within, uh, like 48 hours after this vaccine. And so we we're already that, that, that's when we first kind of started, um, you know, thinking maybe she's not the best person to be giving, you know, vaccines to since her immune system's already compromised. Um, you, you think it might be the other way around, but it, it might not be because they, from, from my experience with doctors over the years, um, they know very little about what they do. Um, they just, uh, they, they spend a lot of time learning Latin and, uh, and, and, and coming up with big words for drugs. So they sound smart. <laughs> Um, but, Why don't you, but, Matt, but you feel like you're holding back. You need to be, you really say well, what you feel. So, no, so, I mean, well, me- medicine's so compartmentalized and the body's not compartmentalized it by any means. And so no, and it's we, just, a, and it, when you start doing sense. holistic things or acupuncture and you start adding things in, you realize there's a whole lot of other stuff out there that works. So now, let's go oh, back yeah. to Amy. So, so yeah. Amy goes, now she's, now she's, she needs a kidney transplant. She and, gets to the point. She gets on dialysis, right? Uh, the her disease progresses. She's on dialysis, um, so she's uh, does her dialysis and she's on it for years. Um, never even gets on a transplant list. It's not even ever brought up until we moved down to Arizona last year. Um, so she'd been on dialysis for six years, and then we got to Arizona, and they're like, "How come you're not on a list? How come you don't have a kidney already? You're young." You know, they looked like at like what the heck's going on, and uh, so we we got on it we're like okay well that's what we need to do so um we got everything all ready to go and and she had all of her levels good and you know and, and everything keeping her um labs everywhere how she they wanted her to have them um and then uh so they tell her in order to be put on the list that she has to get a whole bunch of vaccines including the covid vaccine which we were both against from the get go um just out of our own personal preferences um and uh all it is and along with all the other vaccines that just really didn't make sense um if it's her body and it's going to affect her then she should be the one that gets to choose i would think um if unless it's doing damage to other people you know i mean then then somebody can step in you know but it's not like she's going out and, you know, shooting a bunch of people. She just doesn't want to get a vaccine and wants a kidney. So, um, so because she wouldn't get the vaccines. And they, no, not even going to, no consideration whatsoever. You're basic, basically SOL, not, not going to happen. So now let's fast forward or go backwards or fast forward from that part of the story to April 7th. What happens on April 7th? So, I uh, she, uh, she's, she would uh, have have run-ins of not feeling well, um, and she'd been just kind of slowly getting deteriorating over the years, um, and uh, and uh, she wasn't feeling good, which was normal, um, and didn't really think anything of it, and uh, so she said she went to bed, and uh, she never woke up. 
uh, she passed away in the middle of the night in her sleep. Um, I, uh, I went to bed uh, late, like about one or two. Um, and, uh, I crawled into bed and I was thinking, oh, she's hogging the bed, you know, cause she was kind of like laying with her leg over on my side of the bed, and, but I didn't want to wake her up. So I just kind of like curled into bed and kind of, you know, made wedged in my little spot. And, uh, I'm pretty sure that she was already gone at that point. Um, and, uh, and then when the morning when I woke up and she was still in the same position, I knew something wasn't right. And, uh, so their, their, uh, their take or their, their, um, diagnosis or whatever, uh, final was that, uh, that our heart just finally gave out and, uh, which would be a direct relation to dialysis being on it for seven years. I mean, so really one, hard. one part of the problem of the story is that why didn't doctors tell her to get on a transplant list sooner? Not as you yeah. and I were discussing her, it. Her, 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 so uh, the the kidney doctor is uh, known as a nephrologist. Um, Doctor Charles Zackham has been a nephrologist from uh, Riverbend for years. Um, one day, just out of curiosity, I asked him uh, what percentage of his patients end up uh, needing a transplant. And he said ni about 90%. Um, to me, that seemed absurd that you would be, 90% of the people that come to you with kidney problems are gonna need their kidneys replaced and that they're not even given the um, idea that they can actually heal. Um, we were told that they can't heal. And we actually got her kidney function at one point to go from 15% up to 30% just with like natural juice and nutrition. Um, uh, but, but it was, but you know, you have to, yeah, it almost had to be like a, like just a, a food Nazi, I guess, um, in order to, I, I did in order to get her to eat like that because she liked junk food. So it was really hard to get her to, to, to do that but um we did prove them wrong that that the that the uh, scar scar tissue scar damage from the kidneys um can be reversed just like they found with cirrhosis can be reversed you know so this but the um, second part of this is um is that you because she didn't get and it wasn't just the covid vaccine but the the myriad of vaccines they wanted to be and she had a yeah. reason for not doing that because she had reacted what she thought was to, to that and and it had possibly yeah. her ba her your baby and so so how does that feel for you i mean what do you what do you think don't use any names of people I, anymore though don't I, yeah yeah yeah, yeah no, i apologize um and i i i i i'm outraged uh i feel like i i'm living under in a dictatorship of some sort um i i like for for them from them to say that you have to get this uh you have to get a shot in your arm um otherwise we're gonna let you die because the shot might keep you from dying um the logic there breaks down immediately as soon as you start to uh, get in get a couple sentences into it it does you're like wait a second that doesn't make sense this person's you're gonna let this person die because they won't take something that might keep them from getting sick. Um, it's like, you know, I don't know. It just, it, it, it didn't, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, other than there is um, some, another more, more reasons why they want her to have it than they're, they're being um, upfront with. And um, you said Amy and, towards the end was kind of vacillating going, well, maybe I'll just get it so I can get this thing done but she it wasn't her real wish to have no that. she didn't she didn't she was afraid of it she was scared i mean her uh her, my uh my father-in-law uh back in uh spring break of this last year 2021 um they came down to see us in uh, phoenix and uh, he was normal old jerry you know to, to, to always giving you directions on his hand oh you go over here and you know just always had stories about this and that and just goofy as heck but positive and always happy and uh he, he went back uh back to eugene um got his uh his covid shot he got the johnson and johnson uh shot within three weeks um he was hospitalized he was in the hospital for two months we actually came up to oregon to help out my mother-in-law and um when he got out of the hospital 
he had a big shiner like he'd been punched in the eye um he had like some um bleeding on the brain um like all of the stuff and he wasn't the same person he wasn't all there like he, he had changed um he thought there was he, he thought there was he thought there was people that camped out in their backyard and it was because I, I left a our inflatable kayak i pulled it out and was cleaning it up and he's like oh there's people camping you know he was he just he lost it like right. complete psychosis so she, so she had and she then, had a lot of <clears throat> she had a lot of reasons for not doing what she did for doing what she yeah. did so Matt, yeah. last thing, last thing I want to ask you. So what do you miss the most about her? I I can't even I can't even hardly talk about her. Um everything. Like uh yeah, she was my soulmate. So well, I'm really sorry and I thank you for sharing your story, Matt, and you're very brave. And um I hope people you know, we hear so many people talk about um, the other side of this whole issue and all the people that died from COVID and it's sad and all that stuff. We never hear many stories of people who died because of COVID, but it had nothing to do with her having COVID. And it's a story that people don't want to hear, but obviously it happened. And I thank, you for, your, I thank you for your bravery and coming on here and um, keep in touch with me, okay? Well, I thank you for uh, for for responding and uh, and being so open. They're like uh, welcoming uh, with all of this. this is, it's been helpful. All right. She's 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 happy. She's smiling right now. Okay. And I did connect. <laughs> I gave your information to Bill London, so he may be calling you to put you on the radio too. All right. I really right. appreciate Thanks, it. Thank you, Rick. Later, buddy. All right. How's that? That's pretty sad, huh? Um, yeah, people are coming on here, Matt, and saying they're sorry for your loss. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, all right, let me, one of our sponsors is uh, Mercury Metal. I want to play their uh, little, a little promotion video we did for them, and then we'll get right into the news. And then stick with us, Dave Lovell, running for Springfield County Commissioner, is up after that. So Mercury Metal Design and Fabrication does in the name. We basically fabricate any type of sheet metal. We do any type of structural steel as well. We do chainsaw bar manufacturing. We also do CNC machining, uh, high-end laser cutting, uh, form and fab. We also do custom welding of any type of uh, stuff. We do some stuff on site, but not so much, but most everything in house is all custom sheet metal fabrication. But a lot of the stuff we do for like, uh, there's one company I can't really name the customer, but we do large uh, four by four, Land cruiser type things that go through and that you can live inside of them. They're solar powered, huge tires on them. <laughs> a lot of our stuff is on top of that. So that's good advertisement too. So Lane Community College came in and dropped this off. That This was basically an engine mount for a Cessna that was made between 1979 and 1985. So they asked us for a quick replication of it, made out of chromoly steel, exact measurements. So we'll take it, reverse engineer it, produce a bunch of them for them and give them some replicas because you can't find those anymore so they bring you the actual part and you recreate it yep yep our reverse engineering process yeah that's crazy good evening from the news radio 11 20 a.m and 93.7 fm kpnw studios i'm bill london look at me go host of the wake up call 6 a.m to 9 monday through friday mornings right here on kpnw and streaming at kpnw.com Ooh, shameless plug all right here's a look at some of the stories we're following shoot a person in the head and dump their body to cover up your other crimes and you're good to be released from prison according to governor kate brown Kyle Hedquist was never supposed to see freedom again after a judge sentenced him to life in prison without parole. But Governor Kate Brown knows better. Hedquist was convicted of aggravated murder for the death, the murder, of a teenage foster child. Her name, Nikki Thrasher. That was in Douglas County in 1995. That was following the burglary of Hedquist's aunt's home. And Hedquist possessed numerous stolen items, including electronics and firearms, and he hid them in the home of a co-defendant. Well, while visiting that same home, the victim innocently asked about the property, had no idea that they were evidence of Hedquist's prior crime. 
So in a premeditated plan to protect himself from possible reports to law enforcement, Hedquist tricked Thrasher into driving him to a rural Douglas County location, and then they got out of the car, and he shot her in the head execution style and dumped her body along the road. Hedquist admitted killing her to eliminate a witness in hopes of preventing his own capture. Hedquist was convicted of aggravated murder of Nikki Thrasher and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Oh, but Governor Kate Brown knows better. Marion County Sheriff Joe Cast and the Marion County District Attorney Paige Clarkson said that they have significant safety concerns surrounding the sudden, and in their words, ill-planned governor's commutation of convicted aggravated murderer from Douglas County, Kyle Hedquist. He's 45 years old, and he's being released into the Salem community. Now, Hedquist was also sentenced for robbery in the first degree and three counts of kidnapping in the second degree for a separate incident where, well, he robbed a local pizza hut at gunpoint and took $3,000 for those crimes. He also received 60 months and 20 months, respectively, in prison. Now, despite these, shall we say, horrific facts and violent history, and over the objection of the Douglas County DA, whose office originally handled the prosecution, Governor Brown, knowing best, granted clemency to Hedquist and granted his release. So the Marion County Community Corrections Department, as if this wasn't already bad enough, was notified by the Department of Corrections that Hedquist, who was to be housed at the Oregon State Pen in Salem, was going to be seeking release into Marion County due to community concerns related to any Douglas County residents. Despite community corrections safety-based objections and further requests to release Hedquist to his home county of Douglas, Marion County officials were notified by the parole board they didn't have any choice. Hedquist was going to be released to a South Salem address as provided by the governor's office. He was released at noon on April 15th. Hedquist is now living in a Salem address. District Attorney Paige Clarkson said the case represents a shocking lack of concern by the governor's office for the safety of the community, disregard for transparency of any process, and apathy towards the normal safety protocols for such an obvious risk. A judge in an entirely different part of the state determined that that offender should never be out of a prison, out of a prison cell, according to Clarkson, and yet he's now living in Marion County without the proper safety assurances. Clarkson says... Marion County deserves better than what our state leadership has foisted upon us here. Well, today is voter, uh, well, tomorrow actually, is voter registration and party choice deadline for the May 17th primary election. If you're a new Oregon voter with a valid driver's license, permit, or ID, you can register online at OregonVotes.gov until 11.59 p.m. Tuesday night, marking three weeks till Election Day. And if you don't have any of that, you're going to have to fill out a paper voter registration card. Oh, the inequity. The cards are available at the post office, county libraries, county elections buildings, and they have to have a postmark of April 26th. So a new plan to replace the interstate bridge in Portland would involve bringing TriMet's MAX trains from Portland into downtown Vancouver. And not everyone's happy about it. Now, according to supporters, the push for light rail boils down to a couple of reasons. They say, oh, there's greater demand and has the capacity to transport more people and better aligns with local climate change goals. The executive steering group for the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program announced the transit recommendation last Thursday. It says two other modes of public transportation were on the table, bus on the shoulder and bus rapid transit. But the group believed that extending Portland's right light rail system into Portland made more sense. Vancouver Mayor Ann McInerney Ogle released a statement about the recommendation saying, The option presented today supports our community's future plans for growth and development, serves identified markets and known demand, and integrates existing and future modes and investments to better serve the region. It also supports our stated goals for climate and equity. 
Yeah, nothing says equity like a publicly funded train that smells like vomit and doubles as a moving homeless shelter. By the way, I'm wearing my good equity flannel shirt. However, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler, that actually, well, you know, is the congressperson for that particular area, disagrees with it. She said in part, this decision flies in the face of Southwest Washington voters who have soundly and repeatedly rejected bringing Portland's light rail to Washington, along with the massive cost, river traffic limitations, and public safety concerns that come with it. The most recent effort to replace the bridge, by the way, failed about a decade ago because it included the light rail option. But that's not going to stop them from trying to get out. Because that's what we do in Oregon and elsewhere. We, we just keep trying to push the same old bad ideas and hope that finally somebody will just go, God, will you leave me alone? Okay, fine. <laughs> All right. That's a look at your news tonight. Now it's time for Rick to roll out a certain amount of real. So, Rick, get to rolling. I love him. Bill's that got guts. Hey, Matt, can I bring you on real quick? I can see you out there. Can I bring you on real fast? Okay. Yeah. So, Matt, I talked to Matt McCarl, another Matt, who owns New Leaf Hyperbarics and Wellness Center, and he's going to give you a free hyperbaric treatment. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. So you can go in and try it, see what you think, and then let awesome. us know what you think. But he just got a hold of me, and he said, give Matt a free treatment, and so we're going to put you um, – we're going to get you in there. I'll give him your name and then you just call sure. in and talk to him and set up an appointment, okay? I've been I've been watching this out for years, so I'm super excited. Yeah, good. Okay. All right. I'll see you later, buddy. Thank you, man. Oh, you're welcome, man. Bye bye. I got the greatest sponsors. Don't you think? So Matt McCarl there. Hey, hey David, how you doing, buddy? Hey. So just Matt McCarl just like boom. There we go. Give him a treatment. Here he goes. So how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? House Good. Hunter Man from Montana. It's almost like a like an expedition with big elk or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a homeless uh, ex expedition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so David Lovall has been a friend of mine for years. He took my first photos for KEZI and then used to take those. He took all my campaign photos, took my kids' senior photos because he was a photographer. Well, he still is a photographer, but he doesn't do photography anymore, really. Hmm. Um, so tell people, and now he's running for, he had this crazy idea that he actually asked me about, and I told him, don't do it. <laughs> you're, you're the best advice, not. <laughs> <laughs> so David is running for the Springfield position of the Lane County Board of Commissioners. And so kind of tell people, um, let's not talk about that yet. Tell them what you do, because he's also with his business partners, um, transform downtown Springfield a lot of with along with Bart and all the neighbors but there's a vision for downtown Springfield and you guys and tell people where that money goes with the money you make off that guy and all that kind of oh, stuff. okay all that connection all right so, so downtown Springfield uh, in 2008 I cashed in my 401k convinced my wife to let me take all my life savings and buy the Washburn building and remodel those two apartments upstairs. We figured, you know, all those bars downstairs, if we had someone living down there, maybe we could clean up a little bit of it. Well, it didn't, uh, it, it didn't transform it overnight, but it did cause a momentum to where, you know, a few of those bars finally transitioned out. They have many police calls and, and then people started looking at Springfield as maybe an opportunity. Maybe there was something that it could be besides just antique stores and, you know, sleepy bars and just people driving through it and going right past it. So, uh, you know, Bart came in and like, uh, I think it was probably, oh, was it 10 or 11 or something like that? He came in and it, it started a movement. People started talking about it. And then Washburn Cafe came in. And so then my partners that I've known for 40 years, he did really well in business. And um, I, I went to a, an Africa mission trip and came back and the people there said, well, you know, you should come more often and make more money. And I'm like, I don't know if this guy would sell me the building next door. Maybe we could remodel those eight apartments. Because above a con of sales, there was eight apartments that had been boarded up for 30 years. I mean, nobody knew there was a storefront there where Tavern on Main now sits. Nobody knew the apartments were up there. So we went up there, uh, make a long story short, we ended up buying the building. They made us a good deal and we made them a good deal. And so my partner and I went up and started thrashing hammers and throwing stuff out the back. And 210 yards of debris later, we had a clear vision of what we thought we could do. And one thing led to another. And then now we're on our eighth building. So uh, now most of that money now, 
uh, we, uh, it's called Masaka Properties. It's called Masaka Properties because it's named after the town which we do ministry in Uganda. And uh, we just completed our fourth church build there last week. Uh, we built a couple orphanages, a uh, number of houses, uh, just all kinds of stuff that we've done over there. It's been really great. And your wife, Nita, started helping women. Uh, they, they don't have bridal gowns. And right. So she collects bridal gowns, used bridal gowns here in America and in, in the States, and then takes them over and ships them over to her. And yeah, they, that, that, and that's becoming increasingly difficult. We've we got over 200 dresses over there. She started this wedding business. It's like the nicest boutique in you know that part of Africa. Two of our really great friends run it, and it, it's it's been a wonderful thing. Not only that, but she also went over there in a trip we went last March, and she started a networking group, like a BNI business networking group. In in Uganda and Africa, you don't talk about your business because you know every six blocks someone's doing the same thing, right? So you don't want someone to steal your chunk of the business, but we uh, got these 12 businesses together and in like the third month they were together, they did like seven times the business any of them has ever done. And so that concept is really starting to take traction as well. So you've, you've done this development in there and I know some, some of your opponents are trying to paint you into this developer, but I can tell, I, I know for a fact, David is also the grunt. <laughs> He's the the picking, you know, tearing out the windows, going to bring recycling, finding new cool doors, putting them in these apartments. And if you guys haven't seen them, they're like spectacular. But but doing all that kind of work, so you're not like you're a develop. You're really like a, a visionary who just happens to have a, a good business partner and you know a, a a great ministry that you're doing to help fund that to help your your businesses are funding that ministry there for you yeah i think what's great too is that pe people love a great vision i mean it doesn't matter what side of the politics aisle you're on people want to see success in an area and i think springfield was just longing for it i mean when i was 15 years old i worked at the old girl camera center you know and springfield always finished last and started the last place first you know in an economic downturn so it was really great to see that everybody kind of thought springfield was worth fighting for and got on board with that vision and you know, now it's progressed down to we just bought a building last month right next to the Wildest Theater. Um, we didn't expect to buy it. It just kind of came up and fell out of escrow and we made them an offer. And so now we're now looking at putting a larger footprint of the Community Arts Center right next to the Wildest. Because the Wildest is kind of a, a small building that's kind of underserved by its size. But the potential downtown for the arts community is huge. But, but you've also turned down like people you you and your wife and your business partners you have a vision for what you want yeah. down there yeah. and so you've had businesses come in that really didn't fit the mold and they were going to pay you a lot more money and you said no because you wanted a cafe or you wanted a coffee yeah. shop or you wanted the little friendly street you know new york style uh you know little convenience store uh, you knew what you wanted so you turned down a lot of money so that you could because you know that the the vision is more important than what comes out right right off the bat. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I mean, the biggest reward is not obviously, like you said, the money, but the biggest reward for us has been just in the last year since COVID was going downtown and eating out, takeout food on those picnic tables, but also hearing people from like Eugene and out of town that would come down Springfield and they'd be like, whoa, I never knew Springfield could be like this. So, you know, that, that trumps all the money in the world just to hear people you know, get their passports stamped and come over the Willamette River into Springfield and be amazed. I think that's the greatest room. My favorite comment always was when we'd hang out at the public house or we'd be down at the tavern on Main and you'd come out, you'd see somebody new and they go, oh my gosh, I didn't know this was here. And it's like, it's been here for five or six years. I mean, it's like, you know, it's the new cool place to hang out. So how does all that translate into you wanting to be a, the county commissioner to represent Springfield? I, well, you know, I'm kind of one of those guys that sees the impossible as the possible. So I think that was the first thing. Like I said, when you and I had that conversation, you're like, no, don't do it. You'd be better off as a community person doing what you're doing. But, you know, it seems like the, the county's kind of in this stalled position of, you know, I, I guess wokeness or, or, you know, same status quo is doing the same things over and over. And, you know, Springfield could have been stuck in that same mold too. But when you get a group of people, even if they're different together to agree on a vision, then at least you can, you can move something forward. So uh, I, I think that's really what made me want to run is because I wanted to change more than just downtown Springfield. I wanted, I mean, Eugene, I wanted to change Eugene. I mean, we've just been through some of the, the worst, uh, you know, disruption of Eugene's peace and civility that we've ever seen in downtown. And, and it's not getting better. And I just feel like 
like, you know, someone's got to, someone's got to be the guy that stands up and said, Hey, wait, we, we can't make these decisions anymore. We need to make some hard ones, but some layered ones so we can get back to some sense of who we really are. And, and timber is a huge issue for our County. And, yeah. and it seems to be, um, but it's in my opinion, and it's my show, so I get to have my opinion. With some of the commissioners, it seems that they, um, I live in the McKinsey. I, I used to live in the McKinsey Valley. Um, and when it came to, when I watched what happened to the, to the land up there and what happened with the, you know, the stifling of the restoration and the amount of wood that could have come out of there and been used and, you know, and the carbon that was put into the air because of our piss poor management programs yeah. that we have. Something has to change for Oregon and it's got to start on the local level. So what's your, what's your idea for that? I mean, there's all this talk about, you know, climate plans and all these kinds of things. And it, two things really that are happening. Lane County was basically based on a timber tax County. So we have uh, measures in place that don't allow our property taxes to go up at a, at a high rate. Right now we're paying like a buck 48, a thousand for taxes when in order to fully fund the County, we need to be paying like $5 a thousand for taxes because the timber revenue receipts were buffered into the tax base of this county. You know, back in the 1970s, mid 70s, we were getting 20 to 40 million dollars a year in in a non non discretionary funds for the county budget, which we could fully fund our sheriff's department. We could we could fund all kinds of things. And now, as of 2019, we're only getting five hundred thousand dollars of that money. We're mandated by law to to log the timber on those lands. And let's face it, Rick, really do really four good things in this valley is one, we grow really great grass seed for the entire world. We grow some dang good filberts. Second to us is turkey. We grow some great wine and we grow wood. I mean, people talk about affordable housing and all this other stuff. It's all connected to us stewarding our resources in a way that's not only responsible, but it's environmentally sound. And it's what we do here. We don't grow turnips. Well, what I find interesting too, um, is, you know, following the fires and stuff is, you know, if, if you talk to people who understand forestry, um, timber, regrowing timber is the best carbon filter on the planet. So if people really do believe in green and they're they're concerned about climate change, what the hell are you doing not supporting reforestation and old trees, kind of like old guys like you and me, were not as effective. So the newer trees, the younger trees do a better job of that. So well, what's, why, what concerns you, you, have all this, you have all this burned timber. We have like 600, eight, 600 million acres that burned in the holiday form. For, I don't know, something like that. We have a lot of burned. So now they're saying, oh, we can't salvage log that. And we're going to allow that naturally to reforest itself. Well, that's going to take 200 years. You know, for us to go in there, salvage log out what we can. We'll get money for it. We'll get receipts for it. And if we go in and replant it within 20 years, that forest would be like you're saying. A growing forest under 80 years sequesters all kinds of CO2 you know, much like the rainforest does. And when we talk about climate initiatives, we always talk about taking and taking things away. We never really talk about adding things that really help us meet our goals. Many of the reforestation and forest management plans would help us meet our goals of 2050 that we're laying out without taking all these other things off. For example, California, I've made this statement a while back in a debate and my opponent, chided me for it because it was a California statistic, but it needs to be shared. California is now realizing that managing their forests, it makes a healthier environment, not only for, like you said, the wildfire stuff and the mismanagement that causes all that, but by growing forests, they calculated that if they manage their forests into growing entities again, they could take the equivalent of 13 million cars off the road on their CO2 goals for taking uh, car CO2s out of, out of the air. So to me, that's a that's a viable statistic that we could compare with what we can do here in, in Lane County. We're not going to move the climate world needle an iota in Lane County, not even if everybody stops driving and stops breathing. But we are consistently doing our part and we could do more of our part if we get back to really what our part is. David, somebody's asking how you feel about this roundabout project. Apparently they're saying <laughs> the Springfield Chamber. I had those folks on the show about what they're doing. And um, I, yeah, I don't know if that's. That's you want hot to topic. Super hot topic. I mean, all, all the thousands of doors we've knocked through and went out and Thurston done that. That's like the number one topic. Uh, it, it, that plan's got to be reworked. I mean, you know, just uh, a few weeks ago, we had a log truck tip over trying to go around a roundabout. It's just, you know, a 53 foot container chip truck can't move in and out of Roseboro Lumber through, Roseboro Lumber through a roundabout. 
I, I think the statistics that sold that whole redevelopment of Main Street were a little skewed too. I mean, let's face it, in our culture today, we have a really great skill of selling fear. And, and I think, you know, yeah, the, think, yeah. And so the statistics that they used to sell this safety corridor, like it was the 11th most dangerous place in, 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 in the state, I think we're a little skewed. There was like 696 instances and some of them are bad. I get it. But we're talking about 32 million trips over a five year period was where this was done. And I think I, I think there's better ideas out there. I don't think the roundabouts are it. Well, from what I understood, too, just from talking to these people, and I could be wrong, but now it's OK because I'm just, you know, some dumb shit on, t on a podcast. But um, I understood because was, there was grant money available. I used to love this when I was a news guy. Oh, so there's grant money. So now we'll just do something stupid and just push it through because we have this all these federal dollars there. Well, those are still our dollars. I, I, I think people don't understand that we've lost this concept that tax dollars started in our pocket. And when, when people, other people spend them for projects that maybe the community doesn't support, it's not going to turn out well, you know? I mean, what's crazy is when the government gets money, they get it in like a fiscal time frame, a year or whatever, or two years, and they feel like, oh, they got to spend it all. Otherwise, it's going to go away rather than spend it for the greatest return on investment. They just spend it so that it's gone so that we can get more later, I guess. And and really, the, the funding behind all that, the, the funding with Main Street it, it's, is barely 10 percent complete. So they're talking about funding this as they go and building it as they go. And in my mind, that could take eight years. Yeah. So you're looking at eight years of disruption along Main Street. The average business loss for construction disruption is 40 percent. So you look at all those businesses along Main Street that will be disrupted for six to eight years at 40 percent. I don't think they'll survive it. You know what? Melinda brings up a good point. She's people are so dumb about state and federal grant money. It's what, what, what we really need to do is implement a civics program <clears throat> into our culture where people have to understand. It's kind of like when the timber industry got hammered for the spotted owl, which turned out to not be really the spotted owl. It was this other owl called the Bart owl. But that didn't get a whole lot of press. Yeah. But 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 we shut down this industry and then people cry because there's no money for education. Well, let me explain the ONC timber revenues to you. And you just took one third of the revenue out. And so now you have to make that up or your schools are going to suffer more. And, and we don't think about the consequences. We critically that's what we need in schools today is critical thinking skills. Yeah. Because we don't critically think through if I do this, this may happen. You know, well, they always try to replace it with other things too, like oh, the lottery dollars will save the schools, or the marijuana tax will save the schools. And you know, you know, in 2016, we had Measure 98 that was supposed to give $800 for at-risk students, you know, so that they would go into trade schools. Whatever happened, to all that money in those programs, I have not seen personally and researched. I've not seen any positive outcomes from that yet. No. Stacy so, says so they don't teach civics in school. <clears throat> so what I always say is we should teach less public relations because we have enough bullshit in our culture and we should start teaching more critical thinking skills to get kids to kind of think like that. So, David, what, what's the most important issue that you think that, you know, you're, let's say you're elected, um, your opponent's gone, you're in there. What one thing I hope you will bring is balance. <laughs> I have a, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my whole outlook on entrepreneurialism and development is always return on my investment. What do I get? What do I get for my dollars? And, you know, I see a lot of areas of where we're spending money. I mean, like we spent almost $25 million on the homeless in the last couple of years and we've gotten the same result. So, you know, public safety is number one on my list. I mean, we got full, we got, we got to fund public safety. I rode with a deputy sheriff the other day on a, on a graveyard shift. We have two deputy sheriffs that patrol the entire county of Lane County on a shift and four hours of a 24 hour shift. There ain't anybody. Right. I mean, so, so that to me is just, it's just nonsense. I mean, I grew up with cops. So I understand the value of public safety. I also under, understand the value of everyone being susceptible and, and accountable to the same level of the law. And I think we've adjusted those for toxic charity reasons or whatever. So public safety is huge with me. The other thing is mental health. You know, I've got a dog in this fight. My son, William from Uganda is suffering from mental health and uh, he's been homeless for a year. And the, the rat wheel that we went through in Lane County just looked at, I, I looked at nothing was working. All the, all the, uh, uh, People that, that, that connect and, and, the, and the nonprofits, they weren't connecting and we weren't getting help. And 2.30 in the morning, he was being kicked out of the hospital in the darkness of the street. So, you know, that's got to be that's got to be addressed. I think I think personal and, and private funding 
and entrepreneurship could solve that problem a lot faster than government. Uh, and, and I think the other thing too is we've lost transparency in government. COVID was a great way to go zoom our, our government off into a corner and the public just was without really any input for two years. Well, don't you think though, I, I think people, what they have learned is I, I, cause I watch this as a news guy, you'd sit in there and the squeaky wheels came every week to bitch and moan at the county commissioner meetings. Uh-huh. None of the general public, they were out working, so they didn't have any ability to come into these meetings. But I think what COVID, the reaction to COVID has taught us is that if we don't make time for this, if we yep. don't stand into those meetings and quit abdicating our responsibility and let apathy get a hold, then we are never gonna get this. And I think people are ticked. I think you're yep. gonna see uh, you know, a, a huge switch over with this election of what's going on. I, I pray to God it's not a um, complete, I don't want another super majority ever again in the state of Oregon. I would, I would, you know, I, I think we need to have balance in this state and then the people need to get involved again and realize that once David is elected, he works for you. Absolutely. It's yeah. not the other way around. I don't, David, I don't work for David. He, I'm his boss as the general public. And we have to remember that. Yeah. I mean, it, my position is like, like you said, I'm employed by the people who elected me. Right. So I want to incentivize innovation and entrepreneurism. Like, you know, I, I want to make STCs easier to get a hold of. I want to, I, I want the guy who opened the pizza place on main street to go from a food truck into his first brick and mortar without him having to pay $16,000 to this, to this County for system development charges. You know, I get the County needs the money, but if the County would just go out and get the timber dough, we could, we could say, look, a hundred businesses we will forgive that $16,000. So basically the, the county's in it for 1.6 million. And we've created a hundred different businesses with the average of five to 10 jobs, a business that's nearly a thousand jobs we could create for a $1.6 million investment. To me, right. those numbers make sense. And we need someone to think that way. Right. It's, and that's why I like what you're talking about. Cause you're a businessman you and you do give people breaks and you understand how to work with them. You also understand how to be tough and how to say that there is a standard. And I think we need that in the county, in the board of county commissioners. We need business people like you who actually understand that, you know, that there's not this huge siphon of money that, you know, all you got to do is make another tax and do another thing. Cause you're killing people, you know, yeah. like, like Matt Kendall saying building costs. Yeah. Talk to me. This is, you know, what a crazy thing is we get these county people and city councilors, not all of them, but I'm saying some come on and they they're talking about the homelessness and affordable housing. Oh, shut the hell up because you create so many. I have to put 10 trees and some curb and all this shit on my, to, to build something. And then it ends up costing so much money that no one can afford to buy a house. And then you don't open up the urban growth boundary. So we have no land. So right. if you have less land, you don't have all that. You, you're going to have higher costs. So the very people making these decisions and choices and raising these fees are the ones who are crying that we don't have affordable housing. Well, get off your ass and understand what you're doing. Right. You're right. the problem. Yeah, there's I've talked to so many architects and developers and business people that have these great models of cottage housing. Mm-hmm. Here's the other thing, too. In, in my mind, we need to reeducate ourselves on what we think affordable housing is, because affordable housing, there's no such thing as affordable housing. There's <laughs> such things as housing. And how much do you want to subsidize housing? It's really what we're talking about is subsidized housing. You and me, if we have a house or whatever, we want someone else to get a house who's you know not into the, the, the cycle of being in the market. You know, how much are we going to? How much are we going to match those funds to get them in there? Or how much as a county are we going to enable a cottage uh, development to happen without, like you say, overfeeing it? I talked to an architect the other day. They were talking about putting the parking lot for eight houses in a cottage in the front of the property. Well, the, the county came back and said, oh, no, you got to put it in the, in the rear of the, of, of the property. So that means they wanted the whole 13 space parking lot in the back of the eight unit complex with a 12 foot runway all the way down the side of the property. It totally wastes the, the property they had. So they fought and fought over that and finally made some concessions. But why is that such a hard thing to understand? Right. Well, it's because you don't have people like you serving on these boards and commissions. And we need more people that have <clears throat> actually have experience doing something other than being a um, politician. So that's my, my opinion. Yeah. Well, yeah. David, we we went really long, but I knew we would because we always <laughs> you and I can't just do things short, and you know we, we got opinions. So um, so you guys again, David. Uh, in fact, you have to be. Isn't it tomorrow? 
what's tomorrow? The 27th ballots come out, right? Yeah, 27th the ballots. The ballots come out on Wednesday. Yep. And tomorrow, I think you have to be registered. If you're going to re-register as something, you have to be registered. Now, the county commissioner is a nonpartisan seat, so you don't have to be. In, and, and even all of you non-affiliated voters like me, you can vote in this election. And did you guys, did you know that, did you see the latest stat? Non-affiliated voters have now overtaken the Democrat Party in Oregon. Wow. There are more. It's a slight percentage, but there are more. There were already more than the Republicans, and now they've overtaken the Democrats. The non-affiliated voters are the most powerful voting bloc in all of Oregon. And part of that's Kate Brown's fault because she made voter voters. So people that don't sign up, they just get put into the non-affiliated voters. But hey, you screwed yourself. It doesn't matter to me how you did it. You just did it. But that's a powerful thing. Independent people. You know, yeah, we're, we're looking at all these houses we've been to. And I, I, I can't tell you, it's probably only been maybe a couple of handfuls of people have totally disagreed. But everybody from all walks of life in the political spectrum agree on the four or five major things that we need to fix in our county. And, and, and they really typically right now just don't care about what side of the aisle you're on. Right. So I think that that's a refreshing uh, wave that we're riding right now. And I think, you know, if people just kind of put down their little fences and we all just come to the table again and start talking again and quit these little divisive things and refusal to get off our positions. I think we can do some great things in the next four years. I'm excited. Yeah. All right. David, love all. Thank you for loving all. Amen. Yeah. Love all for all. <laughs> all right. See you, babe. All right. That's David love all. So, um, yeah, I endorse that guy. Um, David will do a great job. If you're on the fence and you don't know what to do, vote for David. He's, he's a great guy. He does. He, he's got vision and, um, I don't know a lot of politicians that have a ton of vision, um, a lot of followers. And David is not a follower. <laughs> we don't need any more followers. We need leaders. And we're already losing Jay Bosevich because he's not going to run again. So that's one of our innovative people that's going. But we will also be having uh, the person, two people coming on. Um, and I, it's next month. Uh, so don't fill out your ballot yet. Um, Terry Duman is running for West Lane County. I hope I'm saying that right. And Kyle Blaine is for East Lane County Commissioner. Uh, so we're going to introduce you to both of those gentlemen as well. So uh, you can go in and vote and do everything uh, that you need to do. Um, gosh, that was a great show. Um, so again, if you guys are sitting around, um, I just, I, I'm just, I know this is my show, so I can do this. Um, would you just, you know, throw some good thoughts towards Matt? Um, or if you're a prayer, you know, prayer for him and Amy, um, that's rough. And, um, if we really are a community of people, even if you disagree with what Matt and Amy's decision was kind of suck it up and be a human and, um, and just throw some good wishes their way, um, because that's what a community does. If we if we truly are a kind community, kindness is a action word. You have to do something. If you truly love people, then love is an action word. You have to do something. Um, if you are a community, community is an action word. You can't just sit there and suck off the community. You have to be a part of it and do something for it. And that doesn't always mean joining the planning commission or doing something like that. Sometimes it just means having a heart for somebody like Matt who came on tonight and bared his soul and told his story because he loved that woman so much. And uh, that's a refreshing thing to see. So, um, and Amy, I know you were a follower of our show. So wherever you are with your glitter on, um, I, I wish you well and um, hope the best for you. And I'm so happy that you are not, no longer in the pain that you were in. Um, I'm Rick Dancer. Tomorrow night we have Elements. We have a really cool interview with a guy from Outdoor Mag. He writes for Outdoor Magazine. Um, and he's talking about exercise and your brain and what the dopamine that you create when you exercise enough that actually kills the pain in your head and your body. It's a fascinating, I mean, you will love, we did this a week ago. We're going to air it tomorrow. Um, that's sponsored by Elements Health Clubs of Lane County. And then Rosa Real Estate Group is also coming on. And they started going to my barber, uh, Renegade Barbershop. So we're going to do a live with my barber, uh, my former barber. And then I'm going in on Saturday because I'm coming back this weekend to do some work in Oregon uh, for a 
10 days and then I'll be back in my home, which is Montana um, now. <laughs> and I'm happy to say that. Have a good night. I'll see you tomorrow night and with much more. And um, yeah, thanks, David, for having the guts to, to run.